All right, we are um, returning to your propositions in the group work in an hour or so. Then you're supposed to present your thoughts, your ideas to three or four other students and you, uh, you will hopefully get some feedback. Could, we, could I just have one or two of your proposed subject areas just to, uh, just to begin with? Anyone who dares put up? One or two propositions. Who's the toughest? <laughs> <laughs> you look quite tough to me. All right. <laughs> I could just read what the, um, our assessing those in place production effi efficiency and effectivity of the production within some within some branches. Case of ships industries. Okay, so it's about production efficiency of vessels, ships, yeah. okay. And then I think you had some sort of an analytical approach, a question related to that. So could you try to repeat the question or the angle, what would you like to... Uh, I'd like to analyze our outsourcing. Outsourcing, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, then we are getting closer. I mean, this is a big area, of course. You could ask hundreds of questions related to this area. Now, Looking at outsourcing is a way of narrowing it down, so that's very good. This is what you're supposed to do. Think about an area that you want to look into, find a particular angle or a more narrower area. Under outsourcing, if we leave your proposition for a minute, any of the other members of the class, what kind of research questions or research angles could we relate to the subject of outsourcing related to production efficiency of vessels. Vessels is the same as ships. Any idea, any questions that could be asked related to this area? Doesn't have to be a proper question. What kind of what what could be interesting? What to study related to this? Okay. Great. Why is this relevant? Because the companies that outsource production like that, they do it because, like Norway, it's a high cost country, so uh, shipyards here uh, outsource the production of the molds because. Okay. The Okay. Yeah. Now, now you have that's interesting because you have in in my mind this was about the operation of ships. You, in your mind, it was about the building of ships, which is great, which is just fine. That shows that there are many different aspects of this. Uh, you were talking about shipbuilding. We could talk about ship operation as well, operations. And your angle was this, because perhaps in this region we have a few shipyards who have done uh, some outsourcing, uh, for instance of the production of the hulls, the basic structure of the vessel uh, has been outsourced to, to shipyards typically in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, that has very much to do with labor costs, because wages are high in Norway. Uh, but if we talk about ship operations, this could also be about outsourcing and labor costs. I don't know any one of you who knows a little bit about shipping. Do you know a term called flagging out? What is this about, flagging out? Or flags of convenience or 
open registries. What is flagging out above? Well, in, um, if, we, if we go 30, 40 years back, a Norwegian-owned vessel would always carry a Norwegian flag at the stern. The flag at the stern tells you in which country the vessel belongs, which registry it belongs to. If you look at a typical Norwegian-owned vessel today doing international business, they would have the flag of Bermuda or, or one of these uh, countries which has uh, what we call flags of convenience or open registries. The reason for that is very much related to labor costs because as long as it's carrying a Norwegian flag, there are regulations saying that uh, the crew of that vessel should be Norwegian citizens and things like that, which have a requirement for higher wages. Okay. So this just serves as an example. This is what you're supposed to do. Find the broad area, find a narrower area uh, within that, find the research angle, interesting aspects. We are getting closer, we are still not asked any questions here, but one of the questions could be, um, for instance, in, shipbuilding, in the shipbuilding contents, uh, context, uh, would, is this outsourcing of the steel production really uh, a cost-saving thing for Norwegian shipyards. There are some of them who have chosen a slightly different approach lately and insourced part of it again and used ro robots to do the welding and things like that, which replaces some of the labor costs with capital investments. So it's definitely possible to ask good questions related to that. Very good so far. Thank you. OK. Let's move on a little bit with uh, uh, the contents of, uh, of the paper, the tips. Could I ask you to turn off the lights on the farthermost uh, bit of the switch? The one close, that one, yes. Thank you. OK. Now let's have a look at a few titles, potential titles. International shipping and the environment. You notice that some of the examples are from the maritime world. This is because this is what I'm teaching in, in other classes. So I'm sorry about that, but we'll have some other questions as or examples as we go. What about this one? International shipping and the environment. Is that a good title? It's quite general, yes. What kind of uh, publication would you expect to have such a title? <coughs> you couldn't get deep enough. No, you couldn't go deep enough. But, but if you look at that title, where would you expect to find such a title? What do you see in mind? What kind of document or what kind of a book? More like a textbook covering a very wide area, maybe a thick one. It describes a subject area, not a problem, or an analytical approach as we talked about in the last hour. Uh, oh, this is hardly readable, but an alternative would be a survey of ship owners' attitude to double hulling of crude tankers. Uh, double hulling is about putting double skins on tankers to avoid oil spills. <laughs> Crude tankers are the tankers that uh, carry the, the, the unprocessed oil, the crude oil, the heavy oil. What about this title then? It's still related to international shipping and the environment. Why is this slightly better? It's more focused. It's more focused, yes. Does it show analytical approach? Yes, because it's, it's about the problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it also indicates how you dealt, dealt with it. It's a survey of their attitudes. Clear indication of both the subject area and the research method used and the research angle. OK, here's uh, another example. It's a bit small print, but cost-benefit analysis of public road projects. 
again, quite broad. What kind of document would you expect to have such a title? Could also be a textbook here, but maybe a manual, a uh, sort of guidebook for people working in the public roads administration or the ministry or something like that. Looks like a comprehensive textbook, does not identify the problem areas that will be addressed, and does not point to the kind of analysis applied. So a better solution, uh, I'm sorry about this green thing, it looks better on my screen than this one. Does prioritizing public road projects according to cost-benefit ratio tell the whole story? An analysis of the possible shortcomings of cost-benefit analysis used as a decision tool. Here we are asking a very specific question. More specifically, narrower indicates the research angle and what problem that we will address. Transport in Norwegian furniture industries. Not much of it left, but there is some furniture industry left in Norway. Um, and here we have narrowed it down to looking at transport in that furniture industry, but it's still quite wide. Uh, the sector is identified, but we don't have a research angle, uh, no questions, no um, indication of the angle. An alternative would be how does the Norwegian furniture industry, uh, it's a misprint as well, uh, evaluate road versus sea transport interviews with managers in the furniture export industry. This is more specific and the methodology is identified. I realized that in a couple of these examples there are surveys and interviews mentioned. This is not what you're supposed to do in this setting. You're not supposed to rely on what we call primary data as this is. You're supposed to rely on secondary data, meaning that existing data sources statistics, literature, is mainly what you are doing. In some rare cases we have had students um, asking a few questions to some managers of some industries and things, and that's perfectly fine, but it's not what we expect in a short thing like this. This would be more relevant for a bigger piece of work, like a master thesis or, or something like that. Okay, searching for literature. You've probably done a bit of this in other settings before. Um, there are many ways of going about this and uh, um, my proposition is that you spend, before you start googling things and, and searching for things on the internet, spend a few minutes on trying to find some good search terms related to your subject. Um, this will help you to narrow down uh, your uh, search quite a bit, and it's not always easy to find the good ones, but you, uh, you could end up with things like this and then try to combine them in order to narrow down the number of hits you have. Could be maritime transport and emissions as a search term, freight transport and mode choice. And of course if you use the general Google or other search engines, you will have too much relevant information normally. Um, but it might be useful if you have good combinations of search strings. Uh, just a small piece of advice would be to use these quotation marks. What happens, anyone who knows what happens if you Google, if you, if you take the term maritime transport and you enter that into the general Google search and then as a second try, you do the same but with quotation marks. What is the different difference? Have you tried this? In the first, it will search everything about marriage and transport. And with the other one, it will search only, only that, that, kind that exact term. Yeah. So in the first case, you will hit anything that has maritime anywhere and transport anywhere in the text. But if you have the quotation marks, it's the term maritime transport as one term. So that's just a 
way of limiting it and, and ensuring that you get a better hit. Even so, if you go into a more advanced search uh, form, you can combine terms like this. And then you will narrow it down even more. And you would need to do that if you use the general terms, uh, general search engines. And um, OK, it could be a good first start to use Google, but there are some better ways. Um, and you need to be fairly critical towards anything you find on the internet, of course. Posting information on the internet is open to anyone, and it doesn't have to be a good source. So you're supposed to look behind it and see if this comes from a serious source that could be used as a reference in your work. If it comes from a blog, it's rarely useful in a setting like this. Blogs are full of very strong statements that might not be uh, well supported and so on. It might be all right if this blog is done by a well-renowned researcher, uh, a major politician, things like that. You could use it. But this is not the kind of sources we are looking for. <coughs> we are looking for research report, research papers, policy paper, official documents, uh, official statistics. And again, if it comes from a stakeholder, pay special attention to the fact that this actually comes from one side of, of uh, the struggle. Keep a crit critical approach. Uh, who provides this information? Are there stakeholders? Is this source credible? Is it provided by stakeholders with a specific mission? OK. Official sites of trusted sources is uh, usually a good source. If you're uh, writing about something related to shipping policies, the International Maritime Organization is a UN body and, uh, and uh, a rather trusted source. Um, rather than using uh, Wikipedia much, Britannica, we have a subscription to Britannica, so if you're inside the computer network of the college, also in the student flats, you will have access to Britannica online, which is a much more solid source than Wikipedia. I wouldn't, but the, in, in some universities, they completely ban the use <coughs> of Wikipedia as a reference. We don't have such a policy, but we are saying that you should have a particularly uh, um, critical approach to what's there. They don't have the same quality assurance procedures as Britannica. But one piece of advice could be, if you find something on Wikipedia, rather than using it as it is, look at the bottom of the page. There are the sources of this information. Look, w which are these sources? And check them out. Are these valuable sources? And does the text coincide with these sources? Then that's some form of quality assurance. OK, we had a point on that. Uh, OK, blogs, really OK. Now, another starting point is um, what we call the BIBSYS database, uh, which contains all, all the elements that are present in Norwegian uh, research libraries and, uh, and from universities and colleges, including the collection that we have up here. Um, it has an English user interface, so it should be available for all of you. Uh, you could ask the librarians uh, up on the third floor to help you. One of the librarians, Ms. Vera Hustmark, she is a specialist on literature for transport and logistics. So if you want someone who knows the databases relevant to transport and logistics, ask for Vera. They are there to help you. So please use them. The BIBSYS database will give you access to anything in Norwegian university libraries. Uh, if it's not present here, you can have it ordered from a different university library at no cost for you. You will have to wait for a few days. If it's an article, you can have it more or less right away, a faxed or, or via scanning an email. And this is at no cost for you. So you just ask the librarians or you can use the BIBSYS interface also to, 
to, um, to ask for loans from other institutions. Okay, now if you for find one book, one research paper, one report that is relevant to your topic, you have an excellent starting point. So I would say half of your search is about finding that valuable source. One fairly new, comprehensive thing dealing with your subject area. Then you have an excellent starting point because then you can start nesting. This, if this is a research paper, it will have 10, 20, 30 references at the end. Look at the ref list of references, check uh, them out. You can find names of researchers there who are dealing with your topic. Then you can use that name as a search term in the general databases afterwards. So once you've found that one valuable source, half of your job is done because you can start nesting. If you use uh, the Web of Science uh, things, these are available through the library web page. You will find databases listed there. If you find the library web pages, and look at databases, you will find some of the scientific databases that we subscribe to quite a lot. And some of them have got an excellent functionality now. You can, uh, you can just click your way through the list of references in many cases now. They are now dynamic links, so you just uh, one click away you can find some of the, the other references. So half of the job is finding that valuable source. Then you can find out which are the journals, which are the authors, that write about my topic. And then you have a, a very good way uh, to, to find more sources. Okay, here are some of uh, the scientific databases. If you ask the librarians for tips, they can also give you a hint on, on where to start looking. The thing is that the BIBSYS database will generally be good for finding books and reports and that sort of thing, but not scientific papers. Where can you find scientific papers? Scientific papers are the top quality papers. They've been through something we call the peer review process. When I'm trying to publish a scientific paper, I have to submit it to a journal. That journal sends it to two, three, four other researchers or professors in, in the world blindly. They don't know who I am, I don't know who they are. This is the double-blind quality assurance system. So finding scientific papers is the top quality source that you can find. And although this is at the bachelor's level, we don't require you to use them, but you will have a big plus in the margin if you are able to apply a few real scientific papers. Why couldn't you find those in the BIBSYS database? Well, they are hidden in the journals. They are. Uh, you can find in the BIBSYS database that we subscribe to this and that journal, the Journal, journal of Maritime Policy and, uh, and Economics, for instance. But you will only find the title in the general database. So you need to go into the Web of Science or some of these other databases to search the individual articles. And we subscribe to thousands of journals, but there might be journals that we don't subscribe to, but you can still find them in these databases. You'll find the abstract. But if you want a copy of a journal article that we don't subscribe to, you can still ask the librarian to get a copy for you. And they will order it from a different library that has a subscription. The library has to pay a little bit for that, but you don't have to pay. You will have a copy. I don't know if they provide them by paper or, or as a scanned copy at the moment, but that might vary. Anyone who's tried or seen the term Google Scholar? Yes, Google Scholar. That's sort of a specific branch of Google, which is dealing with scientific sources. It has become very much better over the last years started out with uh, rather few links and hits. Now this is um, taking over as, as one of the major ways of finding scientific papers. Well, you will find anything here from uh, research papers, uh, reports, uh, and also student work, master theses and things like that that are provided in databases. Um, so that could be 
uh, a good starting point. Uh, if you're logged on to the computer network of the college, quite a number of the hits that you find there you will also be uh, able to download in full text. If we subscribe to it, some of these databases are linked through our, the IP address of our computers, which means that you will have right away the PDF version to download. So that's quite convenient. It doesn't happen always, and if it says you have to pay something, ask the librarians. Sometimes we have to pay, sometimes we do have a subscription, but it's not linked up to the system. Okay, now once you've found your literature, you need to read quite a lot. I would say you would need to relate to 10 times as much as you are going to use in the end. And this means you couldn't start reading it from A through Z, all the pages. Do some form of speed reading. And the speed reading, right, the, tit the title is obviously the first thing. Is this, does this sound interesting in my setting? Okay, if it does, look at the abstract. That's only a few lines. Look at the table of contents, even the references, and then you're able to decide whether this is a good source for you or not. And then I couldn't emphasize enough, keep writing through the whole process. You might even start today by creating the word file that you're going to use. Start writing in your ideas, your thoughts, and use this as a process document. It doesn't, doesn't have to look like the end product at all, but just start writing and also small summaries of what you've read, why is this interesting, and your reflections around it. And don't consider the reading process as separate from the writing. Keep writing through it, the process. I think if you're something like me, I usually think in sequences and uh, do the reading, then I can do the thinking, and then I can do the writing. This is probably not the best way ahead. Start writing from day one. Anyone who've heard about EndNote? This is what we call an add-in program to Word. Um, it keeps track of your references. You can... Um, I need to check now. It used to be that you had to borrow uh, a disk or something from the library. I think now you can download it from Frontier. Have you seen it? I need to check that. We'll po post a message on the, on the Frontier room for, for that. But you, this is a small program that adds into your list menus in Microsoft Word. Uh, and it's sort of a database where you store your ref references. Um, it might be that in a small paper like this you can do this manually. But it's a very good practice to start using it because later on you might have to write a bigger thesis. And this is a great way of keeping uh, a system of your references. And you can then generate the list of references automatically in Word afterwards. When, once you've installed it, there's a new menu in Word which uh, lets you um, add your references. Uh, there is a reference tool in the latest versions of Microsoft Word, but it's much simpler. But it might be all right for, for using it uh, here. OK. Now, the writing of the paper, of course, making the headlines. In Word, you have the opportunity of use something called styles which means that you are, instead of formatting your headings manually, saying that it's this font, it's this size, and so on, use the style called Heading 1 for the main headings, Heading 2 for the subheadings. If you do that, you could auto-generate the table of contents towards the end. You don't have to keep a manual track of the page numbers and things like that. You can add a different heading in between the others, and it will be automatically numbered the right way. So it takes a little bit of learning to start using styles instead of the manual formatting of headings. But it's a get great benefit towards the end. You don't have to redo things, renumber things. It's automatically taken uh, care of, and you can 
auto-generate the table of contents. So try using styles. You can also modify the style afterwards and say that I don't want this to be size 12 but 14 and then it aut automatically changes all the styles of that heading level. Use main headings, subheadings. Uh, sometimes I, I think it's quite useful to to use the numbering. It's not obligatory in a small paper, but use this kind of level headings, maybe even three levels like this. This is also good for the reader because it's very, for you, it's good for structuring your paper. Uh, for the reader, it's very easy to see that if uh, a heading is called 2.1.2, well, you know where it belongs. It belongs under main heading number two and so on. So the structure is immediately clear to both the writer and the reader. OK, in the beginning, you can just enter some of these main headings and maybe a few of the subheadings and then write what you're planning to write about. Here I'm looking for sources that says something about this and that. So it could be a process document for you as well. When you pick up your work again after having not worked with this for a week or two, you can easily get into your work again if you have a document that tells you where you were and what was the last things you, you did. Then you start filling in the contents in this structure. And of course, you can alter the structure as well uh, eventually. Writing the summary and the introduction. This is something that you typically do towards the end, of course. Um, but it's very important, uh, an important bit. Uh, I always get questions, is it, is it necessary to have a summary? I would say it is, even in a small paper like this. And the reason is not only that I would like to see it as a grader, but uh, you could use it diagnostically. If it's difficult to write a good summary, it might be an indication that things are not well structured, you haven't been able to, to address this. So I would advise you to try to write a summary a few weeks before the submission. Maybe this could tell you, learn you a little bit that there are some missing elements in my analysis. I'm not able to present this as a clear line of argument. The general structure of a paper like this, we could call an introduction, a core part, and a conclusion. Um, sometimes I illustrate this as an hourglass type of thing, where you have uh, The reason why I illustrate it like an hourglass is that you usually start with a rather wide perspective in introduction, trying to draw the attention of the reader towards your rather narrow analysis. This is the bigger setting. If we're looking at uh, the labor costs of outsourcing and shipbuilding, for instance, you start by introducing, well, the world of shipbuilding is like this and that. Uh, producing ships in a high cost country is a challenge. Therefore, some companies have chosen to outsource part of the production. Now you're sort of getting the reader's attention, telling the story about the bigger setting. That's the introduction. This is the setting of my analysis. And then you narrow it down, saying that these the, the cost efficiency of producing ships is about the number of issues. You could mention a few of them. I will look into this particular part of it. Then you do the core analysis, and then you widen the perspective towards the end again. We have seen in this analysis that it might be a good idea to outsource, might not be a good idea to outsource in this and that setting. In the bigger setting, this means that maybe Norwegian shipyards, for instance, will insource again. Then you're widening the perspective again a little bit. So you might have this as a mental model of your whole structure. Introduction, why did you choose the topic? Why is it interesting? What is the background here? Uh, we don't have a very formal uh, formulation of hypothesis and things like that in a paper like this normally. 
but some research questions, some interesting research angles should be introduced here. And then how you're going about it. What, which kind of sources have you looked for? Which have you found? What will your basis for the analysis be? And then we leave the core for a minute. We'll come back to that. Conclusion should, of course, be as tight and powerful as possible. It should, of course, be a logical consequence of what you've done before. And you use the conclusion to tie together the different aspects of your analysis. So the question is, the core. Well, one way of writing this core thing uh, is that you can think of it as sort of taking the hand of your reader and guiding him or her through your analysis. Um, you could use <coughs> a term like bridges between the different things, uh, the different elements of your analysis, uh, and say that uh, we have looked at this, now it's a logical uh, next question to, to go further uh, in this and that way. It should constitute a clear line of argument throughout your analysis. And your, uh, the process of doing this, you can start like you've done now, uh, freely associating about uh, subject area. Anyone who knows the term mind mapping? Have you looked at this? Mind mapping is just it's, it's not a uh, very complex complex thing. It's it's basically a brainstorming technique of of uh, maybe drawing a little bit and uh, and having some ideas and uh, and trying to link them and structure them eventually. Okay, drawing lines and circles, trying to make this a coherent whole. For some of you, this might work. Some of you would like a more written approach. Okay. Balance description and analysis. We started out by defining descriptive and analytical. You will need to describe things, of course, but you should need, you should have enough time and pages uh, to do the analysis. Having a good description is something that you need to pass, so you have to present it in a tidy and good way, but it's the analysis that would give you a good mark. So you need time and space for that bit. And um, we will look for whether this is uh, a clear and coherent analysis and it's supported by good evidence. A very simple rule that is uh, in, in the writing of many types of papers is the rule of three, which sounds a bit silly, but which is actually normally quite a good idea. First you tell the reader what you're going to do, write about. This is the introduction in this section. Oh, that, that could also be used for the subsections. In this section, we will focus on this and that. Then you write about it. That's the core. Then you tell the reader what you've written about. Sounds a bit silly when you tell it like that. But it is actually a good rule of thumb, a good structure, summing up towards the end of each major section. In this section, we have seen that this and that. Now let's move on to the next bit. If you're able to do good summaries like this, it's a good indication that your, your core, your analysis is well written. Don't overdo it though. I've seen when I've given this piece of advice, it comes with every bit of uh, small sections. So for this could apply for the whole, uh, the whole uh, essay and also for the major chapters, but not on every small sub-chapter cha level. Okay, narrow and focus is the key <coughs> word for an essay. Stick to the subject and don't wander off and keep sentences short, especially because English is probably the second or third language for all of you. Anyone who are native speakers? No. And this means that uh, if you're anything like me, I tend to make things a bit complicated when I write English. Uh, it's not necessary. It doesn't look more scientific if it's complicated. Uh, try to keep, it, keep your sentences short uh, and, uh, and, uh, and use simple words. That will do. OK. 
Okay. Then we need to pay attention to the uses, using of references, which is absolutely necessary to learn. This is something that you will have to relate to. And most papers that I read from students have shortcomings in this respect. One misconception might be that it looks better if your statement looks as your own IDs. This is not like this. This might be in, in a blog, uh, in, in, in formal sources, but in this world of science, you have to show that you build your conclusions on solid evidence, solid references. If you're able to tell that these are not my conclusions only, these are supported by this scientist, these reports, these valuable statistical sources, you have to, to show what you're building on. And citing other researchers serves to make your paper or your essay much more reliable. And basically presenting something as your own IDE when it's not is cheating. And uh, therefore the active and frequent use of references uh, shows that you have been able to relate your work to the existing knowledge of the subject area. And therefore, if you do this right, this is something that will count heavily in the evaluation of your, uh, your essay. If you, it's not a matter of generating the longest list of references, but if you end up with an essay which only has five references, and if you only have web pages which are not specific uh, on who are, have written them, this is not very good. If you do have 10, 15, 20 valuable sources, scientific papers, research reports on your list of references, this gives an indication of a good quality uh, of your work. And then I will have to warn you a little bit. I don't expect you to, to want to cheat, but you might fall in this uh, without uh, having the intention. So m make sure you pay attention to the fact that you have to give a proper reference whenever you use the source. And this is why you also need to keep writing during the reading process, otherwise you've written something based on a paper and two months later you've forgotten where you got it from and you're not able to give the reference. Uh, so keep track of where you take the elements from. Okay, uh, if you have direct citations, word by word citations, put them in quotation marks. Make it very clear that this is a citation. That's rule number one. Rule number two is that you can use an uh, indirect form of citations, and this gives a better language than using a lot of, of exact citations. Put them into your own sentences, either with a direct reference, like this. If this was a paper I've written in 2010, you would say that according to Yella 2010, one must apply uh, proper referencing. Even better sometimes is that you just write it the way you would do if it was your own words, but you only use an indirect referencing as uh, indicating that this is built on an external source. Yeah. Um, okay. If you do not put in these references or the quotation marks for citations, you might be accused of plagiarism. And that is quite serious because this is part of your exam and therefore the exam this would be equivalent to cheating on your exam. Okay. Keep direct citations to a minimum is a general piece of advice. You could if you if you have an interview you might uh, have more than that. Uh, when you have used references like this you need to have the full reference in the list of references. Uh, and that might look, uh, there are different styles of references. Here's an example of what is called the Harvard reference style. If you use EndNote, as we talked about, the database, you can choose the output style <coughs> uh, as you like. So you can choose the Harvard reference style or some other style 
in EndNote and it would automatically change the formatting. This is the formatting of the Harvard reference style which gives a specific way of, of uh, referen uh, giving a reference to a book. Then uh, it should be like this and the title of the book should be in italics and so on. Uh, if it's an article in the book you should follow this format. Then it's uh, actually the, the title of the article which is in italics. If it's a journal article it's the journal name which is in italics. These things you would either have to learn or you will have to use things like EndNote which, which gives you the right format right away. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll skip a slide or two here. Uh, now, about this database called the Forest that we use, we will run all your essay through this database. Uh, it's located, I think, in, in Holland. Uh, we subscribe to it. Uh, it contains a vast number of reports, articles, papers, internet sources, previ all previous student papers submitted worldwide to this base. We don't know the exact contents of that database, you don't know it. Uh, so it's not possible to make sure it's things are not there. Um, we will have, as a teacher and a marker, we'll have a good report from this database. Um, and this works much smarter than a Google search. Um, yeah, you may have very serious consequences if you, you get accused of plagiarism. So make sure this database is your friend, uh, which will basically guarantee fairness. If some fellow students are allowed to cheat, this would not be good uh, for you. Here, you will all be subjected to this. This is blurred by on purpose, <laughs> but this is the kind of report that I receive as a marker from this database. Here is uh, the uh, original student text. This is the source that the database reports that the student has used. And uh, it's color-coded, so we'll see which words... Look at this paragraph, for instance. All the red text is matching the original source, but the student has tried to change a few words to, to trick it. This would trick a general Google search, but it doesn't trick the database. So it's very obvious to me that this is a deliberate way of trying to avoid being accused of plagiarism by switching a few words. So I'm just telling the, this once. The, this is just a warning. The, this is a very good tool. Uh, we, we have to use it. And, uh, and this is the way it works. OK, enough said about that. We are going to have a break in a minute. Let's just finish this bit, and then we'll do a plenary session towards uh, the end. OK. Towards the end, a bit of quality control is uh, necessary. Uh, of course, use the spell checking and things uh, like this. Uh, clarity and structure. Uh, it, are all my points well supported? This is important. If you make a strong statement, you should either support it by a good line of argument of your own or by external sources. According to these sources, this is so and so. Or because this is, built, uh, is like this and that and build a line of argument, this is so. Don't just come up with strong statements that are not well supported. Should have a solid piece of evidence behind it, either from your own line of argument or from other sources. OK. This is sort of a, a piece of advice that I usually use myself. Towards the end, if you, for instance, limit yourself to, to two level headings in the beginning, you might want to add a third level towards the end um, for every half a page or something like that. What I call newspaper style headings. And what I mean by that is if you look at the newspaper article, it will always highlight the interesting bit of the following story in the headings. <laughs> it's not saying that this, the following seg uh, section is dealing with that and that. That's a boring thing. It's saying that um, could be, I think I had, did, no, I didn't have an example there. Okay, uh, it, if, it, if it was about this outsourcing of uh, labor costs, it could be that uh, um, outsourcing of 
steelworks of Norwegian shipyards has reduced costs by 20%. That's the major content, that's the interesting point of the next sec section, and put it up in the headline. And every small section should have maybe just one major point. Then you can make another section. So oh. you can also use these headings diagnostically. If it's hard to make them, it could be that the next section is uninteresting, redundant. You could just delete it. Or it could be that it has too many aspects and should be divided. There are too many points. It's not possible to summarize it in one of these sentences. And then towards the end, just read the headings. Is this a logical order, or should I move this paragraph up or down in my system? OK, I think I'll leave it to you to read the things about layout. These are more or less self-evident things, but there are shortcomings uh, in this as well. Uh, numbering of pages and all these things. OK. Well, writing things like this it could be very rewarding. Uh, you can follow a, an intellectual question. You can work with your advisor, have feedback. So send an email to, to your advisor if you have questions. Get some feedback on things that you have written. You're free to do that. This is a way of working which is most relevant to many jobs. You're supposed to solve a problem for tell the management about how is this and that, why should we do this and that. This is sort of a problem-based uh, learning approach. And of course, it's uh, quite satisfying when the work is done. This you can read on your own. It's also in your paper, uh, some uh, piece of advice. Now let's break for, let's say, 10 minutes, because we need some time. And then we'll resume at, uh, at uh, 20 past. And we'll do the group bit and the plenary bit towards the end.